Uh, hi, Yaz, Jackie here from the LGFA, and we're uh, in the middle of, about to commence a new series, a mini-series um, of the LGFA talk show, and I have two very, very special guests uh, this afternoon. On the top left-hand side of my screen is Mr. William Harmon, well-known to many of you, LGFA National Development Officer with Remit for Coach Education, and on the bottom of my screen as I look is Dr. Irene Hogan. Uh, Assistant Lecturer, Department of Sport, Leisure and Childhood Studies at the Munster Technological University, MTU Cork Campus. Have I got all of that right, folks? Perfect, Jackie. Yeah, perfect. Good, yeah, good, good. Good to have you on board. So we are here, um, folks, to chat about um, a pretty important uh, subject. Uh, Irene, you have been uh, quite busy in, in recent times and you're going to talk us through exactly what you have been doing. So the focus of your study Iron, was on female coaches and the potential overall topic was coach development and support at club level. There are some key findings arising from your studies that we will talk about um, over the course of, we're going to have three shows on this Will, but today uh, is very much about a generic chat about the study and the key findings. So, Irene, have I teed you up okay? Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Jackie, and thanks, Will, and thanks to the LGFA for this opportunity to, Not I suppose, to get some of my research and some of the findings out there. So I was looking to recently complete a PhD, looking at the role and, I suppose, the experiences and the perspectives of volunteer women coaches within Ladies Good uh, Ladies Gaelic Football. So I was supervised to Mary I, to Dr Richard Bowles and Dr Neve Kitching, who have, you know, ample experience within the sport as well as coaches and, and Neve as a current player. Uh, to get it from others and others. So um, initially I, I would have looked at the ladies football coaches from maybe they were representing 13 clubs and just chatting to them about their overall experiences. Why did they get involved in coaching? Why did they um, leave coaching maybe? Or why were they interested in staying coaching? And, you know, very similar findings that you would expect. Many of them started coaching because their own children started playing or else because they were finished playing and now they wanted to stay involved in their club. So that gave them the kind of the impetus to start coaching. Then their experiences while coaching, and I know we'll talk about it a bit more, but, you know, that unconscious bias that they faced as the, the women starting out coaching that came through very clearly other things that came through and findings were you know they really enjoyed coach education but what they really craved was club specific um, coach education and context specific and what they meant by that was they enjoyed going to the coaching courses maybe delivered by a county board or a run by county board and they enjoyed those um sessions but they felt that look it would be better if i was actually doing some coach education and coach development alongside my other coaches my fellow coaches in my club or that if it was context specific well that would be great as well because i only coach under 12s and i only want to know what i need to know for under 12s i'm not worried about what's going on at minor level or what's going on at senior level so that came through very strong as well and from that then i suppose phase two of my study looked at a community of practice for three clubs within the Limerick area and it was about development I suppose at club level which looked at their club structures maybe their coaching structures and it was really led by them so while I facilitated it in you know my experience as a coach developer I facilitated what the clubs wanted so one club really wanted to go after their club philosophy so what are we about so you know they did questionnaires to give out to their different stakeholder groups um and then another club wanted to really focus in on the coaching. So I went to them and did some practical coaching sessions. We looked at the LGFA competency chart. We looked at how we could kind of map that in to what they're currently doing. So it was very much led by the, the coaches. And then I interviewed and did focus groups with the women coaches from those um, clubs, even though the whole co community practice was attended by both male and female. I would have spoken to the women coaches then just see what is their club specific experience. So how are they getting on? And that bias came up again around you know the expectation that they'd be in that female liaison role or that you know their own confidence levels would keep them coaching at underage and that they never felt that they could go further up in the club so um you know from all that then I suppose 
was the, the kind of an action plan maybe that, that clubs could try and implement and, and try and look at their own, what are we currently doing? What could we do better? And anything we can do that will improve women coaches within um, Ladies Gaelic Football will ultimately work out as well for all volunteers, so male or female, new into the sport or not. So for example, there may be an induction pack. So our new coaches that start off very often kind of left to their own devices. Here's your bag of footballs, you know, see you at the end of the season. Whereas what came back from this study was, well, can we have something like a taster session? Can you show us how a typical training session works? Or is there an induction pack to say, well, how do I go about even organizing a match? So one of the women coaches would have said that they took over coaching their team following um, being the female liaison officer, being at the training sessions and next thing they were the only one left with the team after a few weeks. So they kind of fell into the role of coaching. But for the very first game they organised, no referee turned up because they didn't know that they as the home team should have organised it. So those kind of things around the logistics, if we could put those in place, they'll help new volunteers irrespective of gender. So that's kind of a whistle stop tour is was really jacking on what the research was about um, and I suppose the key findings that came back and led to the next stages. Okay, it's all uh, massively interesting. William, yes? Joe, you know, I suppose we'd be very... It was one day I came up checking, I suppose we're all involved with clubs, aren't we? And one thing that hit me was that guidance and so that early guidance and support checking. You know yourself, we're all coaches and we probably all started in our coaching journeys. Like that early guidance and support, like you mentioned there from a female perspective, but I presume that kind of... Is across the board that any new volunteer coming to our coaching set up, um, Irene and Jack, you probably you probably experienced this as well in your own club, that early support and guidance is very important, but probably sometimes overlooked. Yeah, and I would say that while in my study was only women coaches, because that was the focus of the PhD, but I would think yeah, if we have guidance there for them, if you have a kind of a structure, this is what we do. This is how we target new coaches. This is what once they come down to their first session, this is what we do with them. We have a meeting, we bring them all together. Well, that's going to help all new coaches, irrespective of whether they've played the sport before or irrespective of their gender. So it is definitely, I think, something that's lacking. And I think it's just lacking because we don't have a structure on it we didn't put anything in place so everyone is doing something different so if I'm in charge of the under 12s and I get someone in to help and coach with me well it's kind of left to me to do the induction with them it's left to me to be their mentor as it were so I think if we had something that would be a club kind of a solution and kind of fed into by everyone because everyone starts at some stage and everyone can remember their first night down at training so you know Everyone has had that experience of being left there with your bag of footballs and your stack of cones and told, best of luck, off you go. Uh, Irene, can I ask you, um, and first of all, wh when I made the introduction, I referred to you as Dr. Irene. Are you, uh, uh, I, yes. I suppose technically I haven't um, I haven't graduated. Not a couple of weeks and I'll have the graduation, Good. but I have submitted and I am finished and I, I have no more work to do on it. But I haven't had the cap and gown yet, Jackie, so maybe well, I should Well, apologies. So look, I, we're a little premature, but I'm still going to call you Dr. Irene for, for the purposes <laughs> of this. So we're absolutely fine because we'll be doing this again as yeah, we go I'm through the week. Dr. Irene, and congratulations on an on, 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 on incredible body of work I have to say Irene can I ask you just to, to take it to strip it all back to why you wanted to have a look at all of this and and obviously I've seen your name pop up and in, in various places over the last couple of years since I was uh, I became um, involved in the LGFA in, in, in this particular role your own interest in LGFA and how it led to this particular topic Irene can you talk to us about that yeah, absolutely. So I suppose I am one of the volunteer women coaches that's out there. I started coaching myself um, by doing a coach education course at the age of 16 in an all girls secondary school. So which mightn't be considered uh, traditional back in the, you know, I'll say the 90s, maybe. So it might have been considered the norm that an all girls school would do a GA at the time, a GA coach education course. And it was the late great Eamon Ryan, actually, that was the tutor on that. And um, wow. so my coaching started as a young age and then I had really good uh, women role models in my club that I only now can recognize as role models back then they were just the people that I followed and and watched and and helped out with teams because as a 16 year old you're not driving anywhere you need these people to take you to the matches and to the trainings and to my my own parents would have dropped me to all these different things so that started it and then I became a coach developer and um, years later with the ladies Gaelic and 
through doing that, I could see we have a lot of women coaches attending our coaching courses. So I would have had a kind of an anecdotal figure in my head that most of the courses I did were at least 50 50 and sometimes more. And I know the evidence is there to say that actually it's higher. Females are in a higher percentage than males when it comes to the foundation level. Anyway, fundamentals level um, higher up than the that. I suppose we are falling behind. But yet from my own coaching experience of being involved with colleges when it was CIT and with my own club and Bright Rovers, I just never really saw that many females on the line coaching with other teams. So I wanted, if I was going to study anything for a PhD, I knew it was going to be around coaching, around maybe coach education, but definitely around that piece around women and coaching. And we are out there, but why aren't we out there more? And why are we not the, the coaches or the head coaches with teams? Um, and that was just something I wanted to try and try and see if I could answer. I'm not sure if I fully answered it or not, but that's what I was trying to do anyway, Jackie. And I mean, how, how do you go about actually doing the study then? Because, look, I did a master's before and, then, you know, you, you talk about do you do qualitative or quantitative research? Mm -hmm. what, what's involved in a PhD um, and, and a PhD of, the, of this nature? And what, what type of, you're obviously talking to coaches right across the board, mm -hmm. female coaches. But was there a specific type of coach that you wanted to talk to or was it coaches of various ages, various levels? Yeah, so as I was, I, like yourself, I did a master's back in 2012 as well. And at that time, I did a quantitative study where I looked at players that had had a male coach one year and a female coach the other year. You know, how did they compare and how did they contrast? And what I found really difficult was to find adult team club coaches in the country that were coached by females. So even after doing a national call out with William and Lynn and um, on that, I got three people that three clubs that had had a female coach at adult club level within that period around kind of 2010, 2011, 2012. Now, maybe there's obviously others that just didn't come forward. So then I knew this time, well, that was the quantitative side and I could tell a stat was that, you know, they were happy with their female coaches. There was no difference in actual fact, they were happier with the female coaches, except for one area, which was kind of around the tactical awareness of the game, was the only one where the male scored higher than the females. But this okay. time I knew with a PhD, I suppose overall, Jackie, um, a PhD would be, the big thing is, are you adding something to whatever is out there already? And I knew there wasn't much done on, on women in coaching within LGFA so far. So I knew that would be something new and something topical. Um, then in terms of I knew if I wanted to really understand the experiences of women in coaching, I needed to interview them. I needed to chat with them and do this kind of deep dive into their experiences. So my initial criteria was that just women that were currently coaching for at least five years is how I set it up initially. They had five years coaching experience, currently coaching and have completed the fundamentals. And once they were over 18 years of age, they were included in the first round. And that went out as a national call out as well. So uh, the LGFA very kindly put it out on social media, emailed all their database of coaches. And I had 15 coaches replied and 14 of them continued and actually took part in the study. So again, not a huge number of coaches out there, maybe with the five years experience and currently coaching. And then obviously trying to take, you know, take time out of their schedules to be interviewed by, by me probably was um, another limitation. But then for the phases where I was in the clubs doing the community of practice, I just went with people that had attended at least one session of the community of practice and I interviewed them. And then by the end of the community of practice, they needed to have attended at least two where I was kind of evaluating, well, was the community of practice effective or not in their opinion? So that's kind of, it was over 18 years of age, currently coaching uh, was kind of the main, the main thing. And it didn't matter what age group you were coaching at, what your own level of coaching or playing experience were. It was just more to, um, I, want, I just wanted to get people's experience. So I think of the first 14 I did, there was 13 clubs represented across eight counties. So okay. it was a widespread and um, because it was a national college, which was good too. And Irene, can I ask you and, and to bring William in on this as well? Um, and we will do more of a deep dive into the findings uh, in, in, in the next couple of shows. But William, how important is um, research like this from Irene in terms of shaping coach and practice going forward for, for, for males and females? It's very important, Jackie. And I suppose in recent years, anybody who's attended our coach education programs in LGFA or maybe participated in our LGFA coach education initiatives, such as, you know, Gaelic for Teen, Gaelic for Girls, everything that we're doing now is very much research, I suppose, influenced. 
Um, it's, so it's very important because it informs what we're doing, Jackie. Do you know, it kind of gives a bit of, I suppose, cool evidence-based, yeah. Evidence-based, a hundred percent. We're giving a bit of evidence to the, to the listener or to the coaches in terms of, well, we're advocating this, but it's not just a high in the pie stuff. You know, it's actually backed by research. And I think that's where then people become really engaged in something. And also for ourselves, it's great learning for ourselves as well, Jackie. Like when I started in ladies football, about I say 14 years ago, Jesus, it's amazing how time flies. But about 14 years ago, like we, we didn't have the research. We, we didn't have that data, you know? So therefore we're very much reliant on what was out there existing and maybe just maybe an anecdotal evidence on what we're doing. But now we have the evidence like Irene's research that is now informing and influencing everything we're doing across the board. And um, so it's very much evidence-based. Evidence so it's very important from our sightings and we're actually getting involved in a lot more, um, I suppose, research because in order to develop and improve and enhance what you're doing, Jackie, you need to continually be up to speed in what's going on with, with on the ground. And listening to the, I suppose, the coach on the ground is just, it's, it's invaluable, really, do you know? You're, 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 you're silent here, Jackie. <laughs> Apologies, lads. Yeah, I have to, you'd swear after after two or three years of doing this, I'd know how to work the mute bar, but anyway. Um, we can do research on it, Jackie. We'll do oh. <laughs> Evidence base was it would always lead back to the to, to the mute bar and simply press it. Um, Irene, just to talk to us again about um, you know, you've mentioned some of the key findings. So, what do we really want to home in on as we look forward to the end of this show today and into the next two shows? What 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 can we look forward to? Yeah, I suppose for me it was all about okay, there was the research element and I needed to do X amount to get the research side and to get the PhD completed. But I still wanted it to make a difference on the ground and to actually be impactful um within the LGFA and for the members, you know, and for people that are trying to run clubs and, and volunteering. So I, I'm going to talk a bit more about, you know, what is going on that is maybe a barrier to, to volunteers within our club and particularly women volunteers, um, such as that unconscious bias, and then also to talk about well how do we recruit what can we actively do now to try and recruit for the new season and then not to just focus on recruitment either I think a lot needs to go into kind of the retention of our current volunteers you know we probably lose volunteers every year and we're, lo we're talking about player retention a lot um, but I think we've talked about volunteer retention as well it's one thing getting them in but maybe when we have them in if we can do a bit more to support and develop them in their role I think that might help as well to, um, to reduce the need to keep recruiting at such a high level if we can hold on to the volunteers and develop them and they feel that they're progressing so I'll talk a bit more about that I suppose action plans that we can put in place on the ground for the individuals in the club but also for the club executive and those that are running their clubs and before we get stuck into it so talk to me a little bit about um, unconscious bias and what that means just to, to the to the maybe the uneducated observer including myself to a large degree on this Irene so well, yeah, I think it's probably a fancy title for, I suppose, how we might jump to conclusions about someone. Okay. Um, you know, so if and we've all done it, including me, I've done my research on it, but I've also reflected on how often I've done this, where you see two people walking into the pitch, you see, you know, one carrying footballs and another one carrying cones, one is male, one is female. And you're told, go over and ask the coach something. Who do you go to? You know, you go to the male because we've been kind of conditioned that way. And that's unconscious bias. You don't do it out of being malicious to the female that's walked in the gate. You just expect that that is that the male is the coach. So it's trying to make ourselves aware of the first thought that comes into our head and then the action we do. So while the first thought into my head might be, oh, coach, you asked me, it must be the male. Whereas it's my action, then it's what we can try and maybe change when it comes to the bias. So my, while my first thought might be a bias, my first action is what we can try and maybe create awareness around so that as I'm walking over, I say, sure, why couldn't the female be the coach here? So I go up and I just say, which one of you is the coach, as opposed to making the assumption and making the wrong assumption. And that's just a gender related one. But I think there's also those other biases that came true in my study, like like that blow in status. You know, you still hear people talking about being a blow in to the parish. And I know it's very um, Gaelic game specific, maybe, and it's it's often said kind of tongue in cheek. But, you know, even during the community of practice, people would have said, oh, I won't say anything about that. Now I'm only here 20 years. I'm a blow in still, you know, and things like that that are um, seen as common and the norm around. And then maybe a voice you might have around. um 
you know, the, the parental status is something that came up. So though the women that were in my study that didn't have children playing, but wanted to get involved in coaching, felt that sometimes people were saying, well, why are you involved with these? You don't even have a daughter on the team. So it's that kind of the thoughts we have and the conclusions, I suppose, we jump to, which may not always be accurate. So it's about creating awareness around that because we all have them, but it's how we act on them, I suppose, is what the difference is. Like that's really interesting and just one question from me and William I'll let you wrap it then um, for today uh, you, you mentioned that example of the, the, the two coaches coming in in, in the gate of, of the Astro or, or the complex or, or the field or wherever it might be one is footballs one is cones um, and the, the, the assumption or the suggestion seems to be that if you want to talk to the coach you're going to go to the male right is that is that gender specific is it a male thing to to do that or is it female thing as well or does it is it both i think right. it's both jackie for you know if we're to be honest it's both but it's both of us it's both males and females doing that because we've all only you know i suppose those of the older of us probably haven't seen that many female coaches so we've only ever been um exposed to male coaches so that's what we expect as the norm Mm. And same, you know, when you hear if you're told think of a surgeon, you know, and then, you know, what is the surgeon wearing and you have the white coat, but you, you might go straight to, well, it's a male as opposed to thinking, oh, it could be a female. If you think of a teacher or a nurse, you put, automatically put a gender on it without ever being told. And that's that. I think that happens to all of us. Um, yeah. But I think it's it probably happens a bit more with the males expecting a male to be in that role. And, you know, and we'll talk about it a bit more, but that female liaison officer role, like one of the women in the study referred to that as almost a curse because that gave uh, a role for the the everyone else to assume, well, the woman with the team must be the FLO, you know, be, and okay. especially if there's only one woman with the team, obviously it's her, but if there's two women, oh, they must be doing that together. So that you're kind of pigeonholed into that role when you could have the, the skill set to be the SNC coach or the coach, or you could have as much training done as any of the the men involved with the team. But it's that that culture and that norm that we're exposed to that makes us think like that. That's fascinating, William. What are you looking to to hear more about over the next couple of couple of chats? I mean, we've we've already gone into quite a bit. We've probably run a little over in terms of of the time that we wanted to do today. But it's very, it's just it's great stuff. It's great stuff. And the next show, we'll, I think we'll go into that in more detail, Irene, because I just think that's fascinating. There's a lot more that came from your research. The next show will really cover that as well. And really for that, and I suppose that there's this assumption, Joe, we get people involved, even whether it be male or female, Joe, we get people to help us out with coaching teams. There's an assumption that, you know, you do, you know, you click the water there for me now and you get the footballs and I look after everything else. And it's just that, again, that culture, the traditional way of doing things. And it's just about our approach and our body language and our, you know, we relay that message. I'm reading forward to learning a bit more about that unconscious bias in the next show. But before we go, you mentioned, and I suppose, I'm just conscious that people are listening in terms of community practice. And, and before mm. we wrap it up, is is that mm. idea of, you know, we're, we're supporting each other um, in our clubs, you know, learning from our peers and we're all supporting guiding each other. The community practice concept, a lot of people listening probably are aware maybe of it from a work perspective or maybe even a coaching perspective. And it's just be people gathering together and probably discussing common coaching issues. I suppose it, it's not a really, it's not a new phenomenon in terms of the community practice, but it's probably the focus of a community practice being utilized in a club setting is new. Would that make sense, Irene, in terms of you know this idea? It sounds so simplistic in nature, but I suppose I would question is that practice being done in a lot of clubs currently? So what I'm saying is that I think a lot of people are aware of the concept, but the focus on it from a coach education perspective is possibly new and something that maybe we might discuss over the coming sessions as well, because it is a, a simplistic in nature, but not being done enough really, to be honest with you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and just that community of practice, I suppose, came from the the kind of the literature that I was reading about, and that's what they were doing. But it's interesting that you say there maybe a lot of coaches don't really know what it is. And, you know, the women that I was interviewing at the end of the community practice and in the focus groups, I was asking them, what do they think of that title? And, you know, they, they saw it as a COP, community of practice, and that's what their texts would have said and emails when we were coming back. But really, they didn't really know what it meant and what was it the correct 
name was even also talked about, did it really sum up what we did? Because it was, yes, a community, it was talking about practice, but it became more about kind of club development. And the fear then was, well, if we talk about club development, we might lose the coaches. If we talk about coach development, we might lose the club officers. So this was meant to be for everyone. So the term community practice kind of incorporated everyone because it was new. People didn't really have any perceptions as to how that might run and because it was led by the club whatever direction the club wanted to go in I facilitated that so that gave it a new kind of a style as well as was compared to our coach education which is fairly traditional and prescriptive this is the content this is our syllabus and we finish so this was different um but yeah absolutely it, it is something we can chat more about for sure Definitely. And Reggie, right. before I wrap it over to you, Jackie, dear, like, I'm actually looking forward to learning more about this unconscious bias. I'm really looking forward oh. to learning how can we learn from our peers more in that community practice uh, community practice concept. But I'm also really looking forward to, to show, giving those ideas and those action plans, Jack. I think, you know, over three shows, there's going to be a lot of good stuff there for people just to take little nuggets from um, and probably can relate to a lot of the stuff that we're discussing today as well and over the next two sessions. Absolutely, yeah. We've made a good start today, folks, so I appreciate your time. Um, Irene, you'll be officially a doctor by the time we speak next, um, <laughs> but you're, you're, today you're still a doctor. Yes. Dr. Yeah. Hogan. Today Thank I'm you so much. Read, and in a few weeks' time, I'll still be just Irene. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Irene Hogan, thank you so much today for coming on. William Harmon um, will chat soon as well. Thank you so much for your time, folks, today. I really enjoyed that.